Ooh, that looks tasty. Kingdoms forged of glory and power have fallen in the wake of war. Humble villages, once beacons of hope, have been torn asunder by horrors thought to be things of legend. Your people need a hero to restore order to this chaos. Will you answer the call? Welcome, folks. Today, The Hunger Gamer is back with another Kickstarter preview. And today, we are talking about the Rune Lords board game. Now, this is a game that is being designed by John D'Angelo and Sean Engel and published by Red Gen Games. And it is based on the world of the best-selling fantasy series by David Farland. And before I get started, let me say thank you to Red Gen Games for providing the voiceover introduction today. That was pretty cool. And please make sure you have your Klingon subtitles turned on because if and when I make a mistake or I leave something out that is particularly important, that is where you will find the corrections. So there is a whole bunch going on in this game. And what you are and what you see set up before you is the setup that you need for the solo experience in the combat portion of this game. And that sounds a little confusing because this game is actually two games put in one. You have what is called the sovereignty stage and in that stage you are building your specific rune lord's army it's a deck building game and there will be another video that explains that later on this is called the might stage and this is what you go into after you've done the sovereignty stage or there are also pre-built decks for each rune lord which is what i'm using right now and so this is the might stage that we are looking at and talking about right now. And so what I've done is I've set up the solo mode demo of this because this game also will have a campaign mode and this is just a sample adventure that you can play. It won't spoil any story by playing it. And then at the end of the video I will also talk a little bit about the PvP mode that you can do also. While I have not gotten a chance to actually play PvP other than the short demo I did with John on Tabletop Simulator. I do have a good understanding of how it works, and I'll be able to talk a little bit about that. And finally, I also have to say I do apologize for a little bit of background noise because currently Beatrice, the board game dog, is having a good old time over on the couch, and it wouldn't be fair of me to talk about a board game and then stop her from playing. So if there's some noise there, I do apologize about that. Game is, at least the might stage, it is, is, it is a strategic combat game where you each have your own army and you are deploying them out onto your mat here, and then you are battling it out on the map over there. Now, if you are not particularly interested in how this works, then you're going to want to go ahead and skip ahead to the timestamp that is on the screen right now. There are a lot of things that I have to explain before I can jump into kind of how the game works. And I think the best way to do that is to just go through everything that you are seeing out here in front of you. So I'm going to start down here. This is, for want of a better way to put it, your army board. And so each player selects a rune lord, and I have selected Domand here. And so you always have your rune lord out, and he or she goes right there, and then you have your standee, and it goes right on top of it. I will say now that in the final version of the game, there will be miniatures for all the rune lords, and there will be the option to purchase miniature versions of all of their armies as well. It's also a good time to remind everybody that what you are seeing in front of you is just a prototype. There will be changes in component quality, there may be art changes, and everything that goes along with that. So do keep that in mind. Then you have space for three more units that you are going to be able to deploy as you play. So at any given time, you can only have your Rune Lord and three other units out there. And you'll see each Rune Lord has their own 
army that comes with it, or you have built it during the sovereignty stage. Then over here, we have what's called the Dedicant's Keep, and that is your Rune Lord's power. Let me do a quick digression into the world of the Rune Lords, which is there is the ability of people to give of themselves to a Rune Lord of yourself. And what I mean by that is I could give my sight to someone else, which means I would now no longer be able to see, but that other person would be able to see twice as well. I could give my strength, I could give my wit, I could give my agility, and the idea being people who don't have the means will sacrifice themselves and their ability to someone who can then support their family, and then they live in their dedicants keep. It's a little dark, a little creepy, but kind of a cool mechanic. And so that's what this represents. And then we have just how much of a bonus has been built up for my specific rune lord. And I'll say when you start just a battle, you get two threes, two twos, and two ones. And as you play, you can build that up. And I'll mention that briefly later on. Down here, this is where each character's items can go. And these here are just specific standees for each character when they come out. And you'll note that each one has a number placed on it in a directional arrow. And then I have all the standees for my army up there. Then the next thing is I have over here, and I'll zoom in on this a little bit. And this is the solo board. And so in this scenario, which is determined by the scenario card, it tells me who I am facing. And so I am facing Lord Barrick here in my fight, and I have to destroy him. And then he has with him some brigands, some renegades, and a brute, or brutes, I should say. And they are all set up out here. And then he is also able to summon various mercenaries, which are what are called support tokens, and I will explain that in just a minute. And so that is all of the army of the enemy, and then the enemy has their own support cards, which will make sense in a little bit. I'll explain that with my Rune Lord in just a second. And then also over here we have a space for traps, which can be placed by myself or perhaps by the enemy as well. Down here, I have a space for any enchantments that each hero, each villain, I should say, gets. And the boss starts out with this magic sword right here. King's Request is pretty nasty, and it is a pretty cool little foil card there. And then that's everything that you need to know over there. And then the last thing that we have over here is just we have simple tokens for me to track what I've done. Each character, when they move, they get a when they activate, they get a move action, an attack action, and a utility action. And utility actions do various things, and I'll talk about that once we get stuff out on the board here. The final thing that I have over here is I have two decks of cards. And these decks of cards are, first I have all of my potential troops that I could get. And you'll see they're all here, they're all different. And let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of each of these cards real quick. Clearly we have the name, it's a kinsman. This is their challenge level for want of a better term and I'll explain that in a little bit. Their health, their combat skill, their defense. We have here, this is a human and they gain a minus one to potential crits for every other human on their team out there. This is their basic attack. You use your attack action, you can attack from one hex away and do three damage. Then you wind up rolling the die, the 20 sided die you add your skill, and if your attack is higher than their defense, you have gotten this bonus here as well. For the case of the Kinsman, he gains a haste ability, which is another utility action. And down here, if you roll on your die a natural 19 in this case, you would then spawn one mercenary on an adjacent hex. Though, of course, this guy, for every other human on his team, he would get an additional minus one. Down on the bottom, it tells you he's a fighter. These three items here tells you that he can use melee weapons, armor, or items. And he starts with one weapon already equipped or in the armory. He moves four spaces, and this is called his threat level. And that's the anatomy of these cards. Then this other deck over here are my support cards. And these are various abilities that you can play throughout the game. And you'll see it in a minute but just some of the symbols. So the Grove Tender, if I succeed in attacking, I can also apply poison, or I can use an a utility action, throw away this card to remove a negative effect. 
you'll also see it's called a wild vassal. So when I draw something called a vassal, I can take it and discard it into my dedicant's keep, and I can use that to boost these abilities, but I've lost the use of this card for the rest of the game. I promise we're almost through everything you need to know. I mentioned support tokens earlier when I talked about the mercenaries that the enemy has. Well, each army also has the ability to bring out mercenaries. I showed you one of them with the kinsmen there. And this here are the three types of support tokens that you can get in the game, depending on which rune lord that you are. There's a flame lizard, there's the mercenary and the firehound. My army that I'm using only gets mercenaries right now. So that's what I pulled out. All right, now, that was a lot of stuff that I threw out there and explained, but let's just jump in quickly and I'm gonna show you how a round works. And I accidentally left off a token over here to track what round we're on. So in order to do that, I'm just going to grab one of these bleeding tokens and put this on my board over here, which is actually just off the camera but I'm tracking that we're on round one. So in this scenario, my rune lord, Doman, is being attacked by the unrighteous king here, and that is Lord Beric. And when you do these solo scenarios, you'll have cards here in a spiral notebook that tell you what the stats are, and then you'll be able to pull them from the various decks that you have in the base deck. We have here how you set up, and then we have any special rules here. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but the main special rule is that the big boss will not show up until turn three. To win, I have to kill the big boss. Let us talk about how a round actually works. And luckily, they have a lovely handy dandy card right here that explains it. So the first thing we do is we start in the management phase and we remove all of these turn completed tokens. And this is just what you will wind up putting on a spot on your mat to show that a character has gone and has acted. After you do that, you get to draw one support card and gather one influence. So I will draw my support card here, and I gained an ability here that has three different uses. One only my rune lord can use, one my rune lord cannot use, and the other is just anybody can use. And that would go into my hand. Now, I mentioned influence. Now, influence is not something that is used in this game that I'm playing right now, so I'm not gonna see me track it, but you do use it in the PvP game and you will use it in some of the solo scenarios later on. Each specific scenario has its own use for it and you can use it for gambits. And it tells you what you can do like any other game, you're spending a consumable resource to gain various abilities that you can use. So after we have done that, then we move into your opportunity to send any vassals you want to your dedicant's keep, which that's, as I said, if I drew one that's a vassal, I can take it, I can send it to the dedicant's keep, that's no problem. Then if there's any special abilities you have to do, you do them now. If you have any statuses that are hurting you, you activate them now. Then we go through and we get to choose our deployment zone initiative order. And if we look here at my player mat, you'll see I have one, two, and three. And I showed you on each standee, it's marked one, two, and three. I also have this A, B, and C up here. So what you do when you start is you have to decide in what order are you going to activate those three deployment zones. When you don't have anybody out there, it doesn't matter, but as the game goes on, you're deciding I'm going to activate this minion before my opponent activates whatever their minion is, and that becomes a little bit of a game of chess. So you would each, in the multiplayer game, put these out upside down, then you flip it over, and so I have a, B, and C. Then you finally get to start activating enemies. And in this solo scenario, the first one that goes is the villain. We've already said that the boss over here, he does not activate the first turn. So we would start with the brigand here. Now I almost forgot, and I talked about this, that the various characters start with gear. And you'll see that the brigand here starts with a sword, the brood here starts with the sword, and the renegade starts with a ranged weapon. And so I would collect those out of the preset bags, and I just reach in, I grab one, and this means plus one skill for the renegade. It goes there. And then each of my other two would get one of these, so plus one skill for the brigand, and then also plus one skill for the brute. Pretty simple magic swords for all. And so I start with the first deployment zone, which is two, 
for my enemy. And then I simply take my standee here and I'm going to roll my six-sided die and determine where he gets deployed on deployment zone number five. And in a PvP game, you would get to choose where you're being deployed. And the my deployment zones are these purple tokens out here, and it goes around the board, one, two, three, four, five, and so he deploys right here on that zone. Then I'm gonna look at his card here and see what his AI is. He targets the nearest lowest threat enemy and tries to get into a flank. If he can't do that, then he comes down here and he'll target the nearest highest threat enemy. If there are no valid targets, they'll move to the nearest available hex within range of the nearest target. So they'll just move to try to attack something. In this case, there's no one out there. There is literally nothing for him to do. So he will just sit there. That is the end of his turn. And so on his mat, I'll take the completed token and I put it on his spot to show that he has acted. Now it is my turn and I have a choice. I can activate my Rune Lord. Rune Lord always has priority. You can go whenever you want or I can activate slot A. So I'm gonna show you how it works to spawn a minion of my own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a card from my deck and I got the Baron. So what I do is I take the Baron and I check down here to see what gear he starts with. He gets a magic weapon and a magic armor. I place that here on the spot. I go to my standees here. I will find my Baron. There he is. And I will place him in his standee. My deployment zone for this scenario is all the hexes right around my token right there. So just for sake of argument, I'm going to put them out right here. I neglected to tell you what I'm doing in this. These three spots here are supply caches that the bad guys are coming in trying to destroy, and they'll be bringing in a bunch of mercenaries whose only goal is to bust those things up. So I have deployed him there. I will reach into my bag here and get a token and he also has a magic sword and I will reach into the armor bag here and pull out a magic armor where he gets plus one defense. Now I could take this and put it aside in what's called my armory and hold on to that and give that to somebody else as they're being deployed if I so chose. Then I'm able to activate him. Before I can activate him, I have to draw a card on my turn, and I'm gonna grab a different one so you can see a more normal card, because I apparently did a poor job of shuffling these, and I got an angry mob. So the angry mob, I can choose to, if I want to use it, I can use a move action and spawn two mercenaries, which are the support tokens I told you about, or I can use an attack action and do what it says here. Then if we look at my Baron card, you will see that the Baron can move three spaces, I can choose to use my movement token to not move and draw an additional card. My attack does one damage at a range of one. If I succeed on the roll, I gain an additional one damage for each card in my hand. And if I get a 20, I get to recruit a vassal. And the other thing that I have to do is I have to choose, am I going to be in a defensive stance, which means I simply gain one durability, which is one of these tokens here, and you can have up to two for all the effects and conditions. It can only go up to two. You can be burning two, bleeding two, poison two, etc. Each durability simply means it is a damage reduction. Or I can be in the combat stance, battle stance. And that means I gain plus two skill on my rolls. Just for sake of argument, I'm going to put them in defensive stance. And I will put my one durability on him. Then what I will do for his turn, I will use a special ability to draw myself an extra card. It's another ability here. I cannot attack anything because everyone's too far away. And I will use my utility action to move one hex. One of the many things you can do is you can pick up an item, you can move one hex. So I also could have used this. I could have used that, thrown this card away and gained two durability. So there's lots of different options. Then when my turn is done, I would simply place this on my mat, and now he is done, and we go back to the enemy map over here, and then it'll be the Renegade here. Now, I made a mistake. What I'm supposed to do, just like you saw, I draw a support card every time one of my units activate, I'm supposed to draw one of these cards when an enemy activates. So I failed to draw this Bandit Cutthroat, and so I would have had to deal one damage and poison an enemy 
with the lowest threat on my side. There's nobody out there, so nothing actually happened with the bandit, so that worked out just fine. And then my renegade will also draw one, and he, or she, I should say, has an enchantment. She gets to move three more spaces and can move through her allies or enemies without provoking attacks of opportunity, and it will last for two rounds. So I take this, I put it down next to the card there, and I take two of these blue tokens, and I put it down on top of the card, and that's how long it will last two rounds. At the end of everybody going, blue tokens get pulled off of cards. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward a little bit and get some things out on the map. The only other thing that I need to tell you about is that in this scenario, the enemy has five mercenaries already in their army, and they'll be placing them out and activating them after all four of their minions and stuff have acted. So you will see those out there. So I'm going to go ahead and do a quick fast forward and just set up something on the map to kind of show you how combat works, because I know that is what is particularly interesting to people. Okay, so I've moved forward and I've more or less randomly placed out there a full-scale combat. And just so you know what I have, I also have one of my kinsmen, which I showed you earlier, and he has a haste token on him, which means it's plus one utility action that he can use on his turn. And I have a peacekeeper out, who the main thing to know about him is if he's in a defensive stance, he is able to taunt from one away, which means if a bad guy is one square, excuse me, hex away, then he must attack the Peacekeeper. The Peacekeeper has a enchanted armor. The Kinsman has a sword that inflicts poison. And I'll tell you what poison does is it lowers your maximum hit points. So if you normally have, like the Kinsman, six hit points, if he has one poison, he only has five hit points. Even if he heals, he only heals back up to five. As far as my bad guys go, my Brute here has the Precision ability, which means he gains five skill on a roll, and he has that enchantment for two turns. And I've already shown you the sense of urgency that my Renegade has, and I've just left that as it is. And I've also brought out the boss, and he is out there as well. He's actually right here. So let's talk a little bit about how combat works. And I'm just going to show you a few examples and so you kind of get the idea. So I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to activate Domon here, who is standing right there. And so I'm going to start, say the round started like this. So I'm starting out with my enemies. And if you recall, that means I have to activate right here. I have to activate the Baron. And so I will activate him. And the Baron, as I said, is right here. So I'm going to first check his AI card. And we'll see, he wants to target the highest threat enemy nearby. Luckily for him, there's my kinsman's here, my baron is there, and my peacekeeper is there. And so I look on my cards and I see that it is in fact my kinsman that has the highest threat level, which is a six. So he will turn and attack the kinsman. Now notice I said that he turned because facing is important. If you are attacking, I will turn him here, from one of these two hexes that are the back, but on the side, then the enemy winds up losing two from their armor. If you are directly behind them, not only do you lose two from their armor, but your critical threat goes down by two. So if you need to draw 20 on the die to critical, you now need to roll an 18. Then the next thing that happens is I check his card and he's going to attack. His attack is does three damage from a range of one, if he succeeds on his roll, he gains durability and does two more damage. In addition to that, he has this magic sword that I told us about earlier, which gives him an additional plus three to hit, does another damage, and heals him. And if he heals, whichever of his allies has the lowest health also heals one. It's a very powerful legendary weapon. So what we have is I gain plus three for the weapon and plus two for the bad guy. So I'm adding five to my roll and I'm trying to beat a nine for the extra bonus. I'll roll it and I roll two, I add five, that is a seven. That is less than what I needed. However, it is important to note that in this game, unless you roll a one, you always do your base damage. So that means 
that my kinsman takes three damage from the Lord there and another one damage from the magic weapon, meaning he takes a total of four damage on that hit. So I put my four right on that. Then it becomes my turn. So the first thing I will do is I will draw another support card and I gained a wizard apprentice, which is just delightful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out and I'm going to draw a second card because that is Doman's action. When he activates, he draws a second one. And I got an angry mob, how lovely. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move. And Doman here has a movement of four. And because he has a grace of one, he gets to move one more space. So he can move five hexes. So I'm going to use this wizard apprentice. And I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to use my attack action to apply burning to to all units in this range within four hexes. So I'm going to hit these two guys right here. And because the brute is considered a fighter, he'll take two magic damage. That just means it ignores any kind of durability that he might have. So I'll take my two here, put those on the brute, and I will give my brute two fire. This means at the start of the brute's turn, it'll take two damage, then this will flip over to just be one burning instead of two. Then because I did damage or status effect to a mercenary, the mercenary gets removed. One damage on a support token takes them out. Then I take this and I put it face up on the bottom of my support card pot. Then I'm going to go ahead and I will move and I will just move myself down towards the bad guy so I can show you how attacks for opportunity work. I'm gonna go one, two, three. As soon as I crossed out of that space, I would have gotten attacked. And attacking is very simple. I look at what my defense is. My defense is 10 plus, I look at my glamor in my dedicated keep here, which is plus one, so I'm at 11. And I should have an armor I forgot to grab one earlier, so I'll just grab one now. So I have a 12 defense. So I roll this. I got an 11, which means I take one damage. Had I beaten the number, I would have taken two damage. Had I gotten a critical, I would have taken three damage. That is it. However, I have some durability here, so I just flip that over. That is that. All I have left is a utility action. And so what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to use this card here, the Brace for Impact. I'm going to use my utility action, flip that over in order to gain two durability. I already have one, so I can only gain one of them, but I've used that card and that goes on to the bottom of the deck. And then that would be the end of his turn. So I would take his token, put it on his mat. Now there's only two more things that I really need to show you. That is how you activate your mercenaries, which is pretty simple. I'm gonna grab some of my mercenaries here. I'm gonna throw them out on the mat. You get them through various support cards and I'll just put three of them out here. And you have this support token here. If you have support tokens out there, you can at any time choose to activate them. And it's very simple. You just look at the card and you activate them. So support, they can move three. Their attack does one damage from one range. If they beat the roll, they also apply poison. But you get to activate all of them. So if I were to do that, I could move this guy three, one, two, into the rear flank of the Brute. And the Brute has a defensive value of 10, but because I'm right behind him, it becomes an eight. And my critical threat drops by two, and so instead of being an 18 to deal an extra damage, I need 16 to deal an extra damage. And so I simply roll, and I got a five, so I did not beat his armor, which means I simply do one damage to the Brute, and put that on his car. And then I will get to activate another one. And I'll go one, two, three, also in the rear flank of the Renegade. The Renegade has an armor of 12, which becomes a 10 because I'm in the flank. And I roll and I got a 15. So I would do one damage. And because I got a 15, I would also apply poison to the Renegade. And I would get to act with all of my support tokens and you can have up to five support tokens out there at any given time. And I will remind you the way that the enemy wins this 
is if their support tokens destroy these supply caches here, and that's they can take four damage, and they have to roll a 10 on the die to actually do any damage to them. The last thing I want to show you is just how range works. And range is as simple as you think it is. So we look here, we have the Renegade here that has a range of seven, does two damage if it beats the roll. If there's a negative condition on the enemy, it deals an additional two damage. And if they crit, they apply bleed two. The way bleed works is it does nothing until you move. If you move, you take one damage for each bleed that you have. So very simply, here is the Renegade. The Renegade is, should be facing that way. And we have one, two, three, four. So we will have an, her shoot at my Peacekeeper there. My Peacekeeper, as a reminder, has a defense of nine plus one for 10. And so my Renegade has a skill of two and it has a plus one bow, enchanted bow. And so we roll the die and we have a 16 on the die, which is enough to do damage to my Peacekeeper. So my Peacekeeper will take two damage. And if he had had a status effect, he would take two more damage. And so that is how range works. So in a nutshell, that is the game. And I say in a nutshell, very tongue in cheek because that was a very long description. So what do I like about this game? And I'm gonna start off with, I like a lot of it. I really like the way the combat mechanic works. I like that it is simple. It comes down to you roll a 20-sided die. There's not too many things you have to add up. If you're dealing with your rune lord, it's a little bit more to add up. It's not too much to add up. And it's very clear on the cards what happens with whatever it is that you happen to roll. Very, very clear. I like the way the crits work. I like that there is that added bonus. If you roll really well naturally on the die, you get something else in addition. I think the, the flanking is really valuable. It adds a good level of strategic play to the game. And again, this is a prototype, but the little arrows to tell you which way you're facing, it's simple, well done, in that the bonuses are good. And again, they're not overly complicated. You're not spending a ton of time on the math. So I like that. But what I really like is that unless you roll a one, and anyone who's played any kind of RPG game knows that that's just a disaster. You're always going to do something. You will always deal a base amount of damage. So it really does cut down on the amount of turns that nothing actually is happening. And I really like that. I like these three actions that you always get. Clearly move attack. And I like this utility. I like that if someone has been killed and there is some a weapon or some armor out there, I can use utility action, I can take it and I can equip it. That's awesome. I like that I can use it for just to move one more space. I like that it can help you deal with difficult terrain because there are places where you have to climb or fly or swim. And I didn't go into that, but there are different geographic obstacles that can affect your movement. Everyone can get past them, though some people are just better at doing it. And there are, there are symbols on each person's card. So Domond here can actually wade through water with no effect. But so I, I like all of that. I think the combat is well done. I'm a fan of it. I also like these support tokens. I like that each army has access to them and they're not that hard to get out. In fact, you simply do it by playing cards. So I could have just on my turn when I had Domon, I probably should have, I could have just used my movement action, discarded this, and thrown two of these guys out here, and then suddenly they're helping me fight. I like that they're just mooks. I like that they, anything happens to them, they're gone. They don't do a lot, but you can use so much strategy with them. When I played this the other night, I used a whole bunch of these mercenary skeps, sending them out solely to keep these bad guys here from getting to me. And because in this particular scenario, influence doesn't do anything, there is no gambits, I didn't have to kill those guys. I could just keep them away from me and then was able to win the game fairly easily. So in addition just to the basic way combat works, I also like these battle stances. I like that you get to make a choice and it is a very clear choice of what you're getting. 
you're getting some durability, or you're getting a bonus on your attack. And I like you have to choose that before you do anything. It's a fun little bit of added strategery, as it were. I also like this Dedekind's Keep. It's a little more complicated. It's a little bit hard to track, and it does add some more math, but it is cool. It lets you make your own rune lore and how you want to make it. That's a very cool part of the game. But I think my favorite thing of the game is not the characters, it is these support cards. They are so incredibly varied as you go through. There are so many things that you can do with these cards, and almost any round, as long as you have some cards, you are able to do something with your actions because there's just so much to be done. And I did fail to point out, I think, that at the end of the round, after everybody's gone, you have to discard down to one card. You can only carry one card over each round. But I love these cards. I love what they can do. I like that I can choose you know, to take it and throw it in my Dedekind's Keep to buff up my Rune Lord because you know what? I don't need that one. The options are incredible as far as that goes. I really, really like that. And then the last thing I'm going to throw out is I also like this initiative system. I like that you always have some options. You can always go with your support tokens if you have them. You can always bring in your rune lord. But I like you have to try to plan out your turn before you get to it. And at the same time, I also really like how the spawning works. If there's nobody here, if you've had somebody killed before it comes your time to act, so on B, it's still out there. Suddenly there's an empty spot. I can bring in somebody new, spawn him from my point, and send him out there. I think that is just a wonderful, wonderful way to get more units out there, but at the same time, it keeps it to a skirmish game. For the most part, you got four guys out there and a bunch of little mooks that get killed very easily. I think it keeps the game manageable and does keep it moving. And so the, the last thing I do want to talk about briefly is I want to talk a little bit about the PvP mode. Again, I haven't gotten to actually play one here other than the tabletop simulator demo, but I played the solo mode enough to where I do think I have a good understanding of it. I think it will work very well. Is it different? Yes, because again, you just have two people doing what I'm doing, going back and forth, and you have different spawns, places that you can come from. But I do think it works well, I think it is flavorful, and I do think that all in all, and for both modes, I think the theme feels like it's hit on the head. Now, to be fair, I don't know too much about the theme, but there is enough theme and story just in this demo that I played that I've gone out and gotten the first Rune Lords book and I've been reading it. That's how much I enjoy what's going on. It's dark odd world, and I look forward to learning more about it, but I'm only about 100 pages or so in. So let's move on to my few quibbles that I have with the game. And there's not too many. The first one is, it's a long game. It, it's not a fast game. This is not something you're going to sit down and you're going to play for an hour and be done. It's probably two hours anytime you sit down, and, and maybe longer. I feel like a PvP game would take longer because you're doing a little more analyzing what's going on, whereas in the solo game, the AI is very clear, it's very simple to do what it is you're trying to do. And then my second quibble that I have with the game is it's heavy. I don't mean physically heavy, I mean there's a lot to take in on this game. And you can tell that just by how long my explanation took. There's a lot of rules, there's not a lot of conditions, but there's just so much that can happen, and there's so many cards because each army is different, and you almost need to know what each army can do to really be able to plan for them, and so there's just a lot. Is it a bad thing? No, but this is not a light skirmish game. There are definitely a lot of rules, there's definitely a learning curve, and that is just something to be aware of. And, and that's actually it, folks. Um, I think this is a very cool game. I am very, very excited about playing it with some other people. I'm very excited to get my hands on some more of the solo stuff if I, if I get a chance to. But what I think is really the coolest thing is the way that this synergizes with the other game mode, this sovereignty mode that I told you about, which is the deck building game. You don't have to do it, but you can do it, and what you're actually building 
are all these decks of cards. All of your support cards, that's what you're selecting. And all of your troops, you are also selecting those. And that is its own game. And again, I've gotten to just do a little bit of a demo of it, and I'm going to do another video to show you that, how that works. But I think it has to be mentioned here because that is what is super cool. That is what really brings this together to make it a very exciting game. It also makes it a longer game. It also makes it a heavier game because it's another game you have another rules for. But I think if you like the Rune Lords mythos, the Rune Lords world, this is a game that you must check out. I think if you like fantasy and skirmish games, this is a game that I think you must check out. I think there is so much going for it here. And if you're someone that likes heavier skirmish games, there's a lot of light skirmish games out there that I really am starting to enjoy. But if you want a heavier one, this is a really, really good one. And I will say I've seen sculpts of some of the minis. The minis that they have come here are cool. And there's just a lot going for it. So there you have it, folks. This is coming to Kickstarter in early 2020. You can check the website to learn more about it. I think there is a lot going for it. I think it's absolutely worth checking out. I'm really looking forward to playing this a few more times before I have to send it off to the next reviewer. So as always, if you're familiar with this game and I made some mistakes or things that I really shouldn't have left out, I clearly didn't cover everything, please let me know in the comments with a timestamp and I'll get that into the Klingon subtitles. If you found this video useful, you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, share, because I have lots more coming. In fact, I have another Rune Lords video coming. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.